the Scopes trial in Dayton, Tennessee, here in America, has been described as one of the world's most famous court trials. Uh, others would think the O.J. Simpson trial or something was more important, but I think philosophically, uh, it really was one of the most important trials. Goes back to a hot day in July in uh, Dayton, Tennessee, in 1925. And uh, a lot of people really don't understand what the issue was in the trial. It was a test case. Uh, the general notion most of us get is a, is a teacher was teaching evolution in a public school, and uh, the people, the, the, the police, the, uh, the mayor, whatever, of Dayton came into the classroom and took this poor teacher out and put them in jail, and uh, they got fined $100 for teaching evolution. Uh, there's much more behind the story. Uh, it all really kind of begins with the Butler Act. Uh, Butler was a state representative in Tennessee, and uh, uh, he had proposed a, a act that would forbid not the teaching of evolution, that could be taught, but would forbid teaching that man evolved from a lower order of animals. It's interesting, already in 1925, much of the church had made their peace with Darwin. Uh, they had accepted evolution for the most part. They just didn't want to believe that man evolved. Uh, you can have clams evolve, you can have oysters evolve, maybe even the monkeys evolve, but please, not humans. So they wanted to hold the humans up above the fray. And there were actually 36 bills that were passed in 20 different states back in 1925 that all read basically the same way. They were based in one another. And that is they would forbid just the teaching that man evolved from a lower order of animals. And uh, the American Civil Liberties Union in New York City became concerned about that and they were the ones that initiated the Scopes trial, not the people of Dayton, Tennessee. Uh, the American Civil Liberties Union uh, was a little leery of making this uh, a case against religion, science and religion. They wanted to make it more of an academic freedom argument. And so uh, they uh, chose the state of Tennessee. I'm not sure why they could have chosen 20 other states. Chose the state of Tennessee, ran an ad in the newspapers looking for a teacher who would be willing uh, in the courts to do a test case that would try to make this Butler Act unenforceable, basically, in the name of academic freedom. Unfortunately, interesting string of events, uh, a man by the name of uh, George Replaya uh, was a mining engineer in the Dayton area, happened to be down in Chattanooga, read the ad in the Chattanooga newspaper, and he thought, wow, if we could have a trial like that in Dayton, that would bring a lot of investment into this little town. And uh, he w had, uh, was part of the Cumberland Iron uh, and uh, Coal company and so to get shipping uh, boats to bring the ore down the river he thought we'll have this big court trial. So he had a friend who was a school teacher. His name was John Scopes. John Scopes is another interesting case. He uh, was a pre-law major at the University of Kentucky not far from here and he taught for one year out of his entire life and that was in the Ray County School District in Dayton, Tennessee. Not being trained in science uh, he uh, taught some math classes and coached the football team. And I understand the, co the football team did rather well uh, under Scope, so I don't have to tell you. He was popular in town. Nobody really knew or cared how well he taught his math, but he was a good coach. Uh, but Replaya talked John Scopes into participating with the American Civil Liberties Union to be that teacher to do this test case. Uh, Scopes tried to argue out of it, saying that he wasn't the teacher, that his only teaching experience in science is at the end of the school year, the biology teacher, a certain Mr. Ferguson, took ill. And he basically uh, kind of babysat the students during those last two weeks as they uh, uh, looked through their textbook to prepare for the final exam. Uh, so that's as close as he got to teaching it. Uh, but Replaya said, well, wait a minute. The textbook that they use in the class, that teaches that man evolved from apes, doesn't it? And they're ape-like creatures. And so it was really on the basis of that that they could say it was legitimate that John Scopes. Now, oh, by the way, what did, that, what did that textbook teach? I have here some quotes from Hunter's Civic Biology, which is the very book being used by Scopes in the classroom. 
And this was a prevailing thinking at, at, at that time. It was very strongly committed to eugenics uh, of a superior race of people through selective breeding. And here's some quotes from the book. It says, we follow the early history of man upon the earth. We find that at first he must have been little better than one of the lower animals. So there you go. That would, that would fit the, the law being against the law. At the present time, there exist upon the earth five races or varieties of man, the highest type of all, the Caucasians, naturally, represented by the civilized white inhabitants of Europe and America. Then they talk about defective people in the eugenics part, uh, mentally retarded people, and it said, if such people were lower animals, we would probably kill them off to prevent them from spreading. We do have the remedy, it goes on to say, of separating the sexes in asylums or other places and in various ways of preventing intermarriage and the possibilities of perpetuating such a low and degenerate race. Well, that's the sort of book the ACLU and even a lot of th liberal theologians at the time thought was science and was appropriate. Uh, so Scopes agreed reluctantly to participate, and he did. Trials interesting. Today, trials go on forever. I, I think it took months just to find uh, who were going to be the jurists in the O.G. Simpson case. The entire Scopes trial is eight days long. One day for selection of the jury and seven days to get her done. Uh, it was an amazing thing. Reporters came from all over the world. Over 200 reporters inundated this little town. Because uh, it was an issue, you know, uh, the old ape man, uh, did man evolve from apes, creation versus evolution. Uh, people vacated their homes in Dayton, Tennessee to allow the reporters to move in because there wasn't enough hotels. They were sleeping over the tops of stores and everything else. The transatlantic cable had just been laid, so it was the first trial to be broadcast uh, across the uh, to, to Europe and elsewhere. Uh, it was the first American trial to get totally national interest. So the entire nation was following it. All the newspapers were following it. And, of course, the reporters often had their own axe to grind about how they wanted to present the trial and the people of Dayton, Tennessee. In general, thanks to the movie Inherit the Wind, Christians have come out looking rather badly. Uh, but Inherit the Wind, uh, almost nothing about the movie uh, is accurate when it deals with the specifics of what happened at the Scopes trial. Basically, uh, what happened uh, is uh, a famous, two famous people became involved as a prosecution and the defense. Uh, Williams Jennings Bryan was a very famous person. He was really the leader of the Democratic Party for 30 years and three times ran for president of the United States. Oddly enough, was never elected. And apparently one of the reasons he never was elected, that although he was a conservative Christian, he was a liberal every other way. <laughs> He was so progressive that Clarence Darrow, who became the lawyer for the uh, defense, a well-known atheist slash agnostic, voted for Bryan and supported him in two of his runs. But when he became aware of his religious views, kind of dropped him. So it starts out as a, a really an interesting pair up between William Jennings Bryan, uh, theologically rather conservative, had taught a huge Sunday school class in Florida that attracted thousands of people, uh, and very important politician in the Democratic Party. Also, he was a Chautauqua speaker. He went around to all these little towns and gave lectures from the band shell. And if you read some of these lectures, none of them would work today. People wouldn't understand what the words mean. It drew upon a deep knowledge of, of Bible uh, facts and Greek uh, lore and literature and mythology. I mean, if you didn't have a background, you wouldn't understand what he was saying. And I think, boy, we've come down a long ways. None of those speeches would fly today. Uh, but be that as it may, we have Brian uh, basically being uh, the uh, prosecutor and Darrow being the defense. At the time, they were both older gentlemen. Darrow was uh, uh, 70 or was 68 at the time of the trial getting to the end of his career, uh, incredibly successful criminal lawyer. Uh, he particularly liked cases that were difficult and unpopular. He, he'd like to defend the murderer by basically arguing that, uh, well, how we behave depends on chemicals and hormones in our body, uh, and we're just basically machines, and therefore we can't help be held responsible. The case he had just before the Scopes trial was Leopold and Loeb. 
where they defended two young boys that did basically a thrill killing of a young boy, Bobby Franks, and thought they had committed the perfect crime because they had such a high opinion of their intellect. In fact, one of them left his glasses behind. And being from a very affluent family, these glasses were quite unlike <laughs> anyone else's glasses in the community. And they were quickly uh, apprehended. But they were spared uh, a death sentence thanks to William Jennings Bryan. So here's Bryan uh, in the courthouse with, uh, uh, or Clarence Darrow with William Jennings Bryan. And uh, it was quite a, a fire show. Darrow tried to go through all the miracles of the Bible and say, do you really believe, particularly the flood, you really believe there was a Noah's Ark? And uh, at times he would just get ridiculous. He would ask questions like, do you really believe that Jonah swallowed the whale? You know, silly things like this. And his ridicule of Christianity wasn't going over. And his approach was so unpopular that even the American Civil Liberties Union did not choose Darrow to prosecute the appeal when it went to the state appeals court. They got somebody else because Brian's hostility to Christianity was palpable. Uh, or Darrow's uh, was palpable. Brian, on the other hand, did well when he uh, defended scripture by its authority. But he didn't do so well when he kind of went out on his own and I think pride may have been a bit of a problem. Throughout the whole case, they tried to argue that evolution was important to teach in the schools because if you didn't understand evolution, you wouldn't understand embryology. They equated embryology with evolution. They took the development of humans from one cell, a fertilized egg, developing to an adult as basically being what evolution was about. And even the experts that came in perpetuated that. And the average layman there, of course, was bamboozled. They had no idea that embryology in itself has nothing directly to do with uh, evolution. Uh, the judge got so confused that he asked Darrow, are you really telling us that all life came from one you know, primordial cell? And Darrow answered, well, Your Honor, I'm not so sure. You came from one cell. I came from one cell. You see the game being played here? They're back to equating embryology with uh, evolution. Well, uh, uh, Brian, uh, I think through his own pride, had foolishly agreed to take the witness stand as an expert on Christianity and creation with the understanding that Darrow would take the witness stand as an expert on atheism. Darrow agreed to that, but Darrow being the clever rascal that he was had no intention of being grilled by Brian after what he was going to put uh, Brian through. And I can give you his downfall. Darrow questioned him again and again on miracles, tried to get him to shake loose on these miracles, that they're not scientific, that we trust science, not the Bible. Certain things we know can't happen. We know there wasn't a global flood, according to Darrow. But where his Achilles heel was for Brian was on the age of the earth. Brian uh, was questioned by Darrow very specifically on this, and uh, this really brought the trial to a close. Uh, I'm quoting right from the transcript of the trial. Do you think the earth was made in six days, Darrow asked Brian? Not in six days of 24 hours. Darrow says, doesn't it say so in the Bible? And Brian says, no, sir. And then Darrow says something I, I have a hard time reading. He said, does the statement the morning and evening were the first day and the morning and evening were the second day mean anything to you? Darrow asked Brian. And Brian says, I do not see that there's any necessity for constructing the words evening and morning as meaning necessarily a 24-hour day. And Darrow says, so creation might have uh, continued for a very long time. And Darrow says it might have continued for millions of years. Now, you know where Brian went, or Darrow went with that. He said, look, when how we understand science conflicts with how we understand Scripture from Scripture, science trumps Scripture. Because that's exactly what Brian allowed Darrow to get away with, uh, to let, and if you're going to let science trump Scripture in one thing, where do you stop? You know, where's the end of it? And so Darrow came in the next day and instructed the judge to instruct, or asked the judge to instruct the jury to find his own client guilty as charged. <laughs> that's, uh, 
that brought the whole case to an end. No wonder, no wonder the trial only lasted eight days. Uh, how many times in the history of jurisprudence has the lawyer for the defense asked the judge to find his own client guilty as charged? Because Darrow's whole purpose had nothing to do with the guilt or innocence of uh, John Scopes. Because the only question was, did John Scopes teach that man came from a lower order of animals or not? It wasn't, is evolution true or not? That's a separate issue. Uh, so what Darrow really wanted to do was to just make a case for evolution, that it be taught in the public schools, and uh, what happened to Scopes was neither here nor there. So uh, it's a kind of a, a sad moment in history uh, for the Christian, but there's something we can learn from it, and that is if we cave on Scripture, uh, if we let not really science trump uh, scripture, but our interpretation and speculation in science. Uh, the law of gravity is not incompatible with scripture. In fact, most of science has no problem with scripture. Uh, my whole career was in science at a pretty high academic level. And uh, in all of the papers I published and all of the people I work with, I believe all of whom were agnostics or atheists, had no problem scientifically, as long as you stick to the observable, the repeatable, the testable. But when we try to make speculative science, so-called historical science, the origin of man, the origin of life, the origin of the universe, when we try to deal with that, uh, we have to bring a starting assumption to it. And that starting assumption is either, is the material world all there is? Or is there something above the material world, supernatural, i.e. God? And depending on how we answer that question is gonna depend on not only how we interpret the world, but even what questions we ask. Uh, so it still comes down to starting assumptions. Are we alone? Is it just matter, energy, time, and space, and we're hurtling through space? If so, what's the difference? Who cares what anybody believes? Uh, sooner or later, we'll all be dead, and sooner or later, we'll be long forgotten, and no one will ever know we were here. We won't know we were here, according to the atheist view. But according to the biblical view, the scriptural view, we do have a real beginning. There is a God who is a creator who has created us. That explains the marvelous complexity we've been talking about the integrated complexity, the parts working together. And uh, when you have that view, the whole worldview changes. Now you do really have a purpose in life. You not only have a purpose here while you're on earth to raise God-fearing children in a God-fearing family, uh, to contribute positively through your labor uh, and through your speech and your writing, your communication, bringing others to come to know the Lord as their Savior, but after this, we have an eternity. Not only do we have meaning for now, you know, if it was only meaning for now, uh, I'm uh, 78. Uh, life's gone by kind of quickly as I look back on it now, but it was slow going through in the process. And uh, I just think, if this is all there is, losing a wife to cancer, suffering cancer with a second wife, and uh, myself included, uh, the pains and the problems and the disappointments and some fun too. But uh, I'm not sure it would have been worth the trip if it was just for this, for this life to live and die like some sort of an animal and that's the end of us. Uh, but not only have I had greater joy in this life with my family and coming to know the Lord and, and marveling over his wonderful creation and having had an opportunity to work with it hands-on in the laboratory, I not only have that, but I have life eternal, too. And I uh, have no idea what that's going to be like. Uh, I, I keep thinking of a baby in the womb. Imagine if you're outside the womb and the baby's in the womb, see, and you, you have a little microphone. And you say, George, and your name is going to be George. You will be born tomorrow. But I wanted to give you a heads up on what the world will be like. First, I'd like to explain the beauty of a sunset. How would you do that? A babe in the womb. I'd like to tell you about the beauty of a rose or how wonderful your family is that are going to be taking it. You can't know that. It's something too profound. That's the way we are. We're like the babe in the womb right now, and the Lord has tried in Scripture to tell us what heaven will be like. And it resorts to poetry because what else can you do? You can't describe something beautiful usually in literal terms. 
you know, I might describe, uh, you know, the eyes of my wife are, are lovely. If I said they're like uh, two turquoise pools of water, you might think she must be beautiful. On the other hand, if you took that literally, you think your wife has two puddles of water here that look for eyes. No, we use poetry. And God uses poetry in part to, to talk about uh, a city with a great pearl for gate and, and streets of glass and uh, gold that was clear like glass. Uh, it's really much more magnificent than that. To me, the best literal explanation of what heaven will be like is the problems and troubles of this world are not worthy to be compared with the joy that is to come. I know what the troubles are and the problems. Not all of them, but I had my share. And when I know that the worst problems I've had here are not worth comparing to the joy that lay ahead, Boy, I talk about a purpose in life. I can enjoy my life here and enjoy a life to come. And I think that's what Christianity is all about.